Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon and welcome to this, the first lecture in the course about compilers and interpreters in Swedish Kompilatorer och Interpretatorer. My name is Thomas Padron McCarthy and I will be the responsible teacher for this course. Uh, so, a course about compilers and interpreters. Well, uh, <clears throat> do you need to learn what a compiler is? Or do you already know what a compiler is? What is a compiler? It compiles. It compiles. It translates uh, text. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it translates uh, a program. It tra it's a program that translates another program from one format to another typically from source code to some sort of executable code. Uh, so what we're going to do in this course is not to learn what a compiler is, and we're not going, going to learn how to use a compiler, because you already know this. You are reasonably competent programmers. Instead, we're looking at how a compiler works internally. And we will learn how to build a compiler, or at least parts of it. You can wonder, why do we need a course about compilers and interpreters? Well, one reason is, of course, that if you are going to work as compiler developers, you will need this course. But then you will need a lot more courses, and also um, few of you will actually work as compiler developers at Microsoft or Free Software Foundation or somewhere else. Uh, instead, it's two other useful, or maybe three other useful reasons uh, that we have this course. And the first one is, despite what I said before, it's a bit about how to use a compiler. Uh, when you have a development environment like Visual Studio, you have this green arrow here. And you click it, and everything automatically works. You've written your program, you click it, it compiles and it runs. Except, of course, usually it doesn't because you get some sort of errors. And to understand what went wrong, it is useful to know a bit about how the compiler works internally. For example, what's the difference between an undefined function and an undeclared function? Uh, is the problem that you did something wrong in your source code in this little module? Or is the problem the interface to other modules? To understand that, you need to know a bit about how the compiler works. And also, when your program runs but doesn't work as expected, it crashes or it gives the wrong result, then you need to know a bit again about how it works internally. What kind of code does the compiler generate and then run? Uh, also, another reason to have a course <coughs> is that some of the techniques you learn here in uh, the compiler course, uh, techniques that are, that are developed to build compilers, are useful for many other uh, types of programs. Any program that reads text, structured text of some type, let's say a configuration file or, or um, um, yeah, some declaration file of some kind, uh, will benefit from using techniques from compilers. For example, how to split the input into tokens, which is uh, the smallest type of uh, meaningful information, and how to split up the, pro uh, the program into parts that will work well together. So there are a number of reasons to learn about compilers, bes uh, <coughs> besides, of course, to actually write compilers. Okay. What you're supposed to know already, except what a compiler is, and maybe also what an interpreter is. What's the difference between a compiler and an interpreter? What would you say? Something is uh, for it's being used and uh, translates text to a uh, language that's a compiler, and the interpreter is doing it live. And, uh, you say that it's interpreting it as it goes. Yeah. The in uh, interpreters have better, well, have better uh, error detection 
Maybe. Could be. Uh, the main difference is, of course, that the compiler translates the program into another form, and then you can run that other form, uh, while the compiler actually performs the actions in the program. Okay. So, can you say that uh, compilers can contain interpreters? Uh, possible, possible, but uh, I would you say usually it's the other way, that when you have an interpreter, that will run your program, perform what the program tells it to do. It will usually translate your source code into some internal format and then run it. But there are... Um, sometimes it's not entirely clear if a certain program is a compiler or an interpreter. For example, if you look at uh, <coughs> uh, the .NET environments and C Sharp or the Java environment. Uh, both of them translate your source code into uh, an intermediate format and then run that intermediate format uh, in the case of Java as an interpreter and in the case of C Sharp uh, <coughs> by just-in-time compilation to actually compile that intermediate format to executable code. Java can do that too. but. Uh, it is sometimes not entirely clear what is what here. Okay? So what's the main difference? The main difference is that the interpreter performs the actions in the program directly, while the compiler translates it to another form. So then, then you can run that other, that other form. Okay? Uh, <coughs> what you uh, need to know, except of what a compiler and interpreter is, uh, Basics of how computer, computers work. Uh, let's say uh, main memory, uh, secondary memory, like disk, cache, so um, what is a cache? Yeah, small temporary memory that's faster than some other memory. So, for example, if you have main memory, it's, it is very fast, but not as fast as, a, uh, as the CPU. So, between main memory and cache, you have a smaller memory where you can store some of the data. You also know how to program. So, you're expected to know programming. Uh, we will use a lot of C in this course, uh, some C++, and you need to know at least one of these languages. And if you don't, it will be hard in the beginning and you need to uh, learn them very quickly. Also, data structures. especially trees, and not just binary trees where each node has at most two subtrees, but also higher order trees with more nodes, more subtrees under each node. We have a course book. Um, <clears throat> this is an older edition. Uh, it's called the Dragon Book. It's the most famous compiler book. Uh, this one, the first one had a green dragon, then it was updated to a red dragon, and the current book has a purple dragon, even though there are some uh, versions of the book that doesn't have a dragon at all on it, but it's still the Dragon Book. This is the book you need. Uh, <coughs> we will not be able to cover all the stuff in the book, but the most important parts. We have um, 12 lectures and a number of assignments that you will do. Uh, there's also scheduled lab time in, in uh, some of the computer rooms here uh, where you can do this, these assignments, but you will need to um, 
probably work quite a lot more than just the scheduled lab time. And also don't expect that it is one assignment per such scheduled lab time. Some, at least, some of them will take longer and some will take shorter time. Uh, the grade in the course uh, <coughs> is decided by how many of these assignments you do. So the exam, the written exam at the end of the course, is just a pass-fail to check that you have understood the basics of the course. Okay? Any questions about the course and what I've said so far before we start with the actual content of the course? No? Good. Here is a compiler. Even if a compiler is usually a program and not a uh, hardware box like this. And you have input, your uh, source program, written in a source language. For example, uh, C, Java, or some other high-level language. You have um, output from the compiler. Which is the target program in a target language? Uh, could be assembler, which then needs to be run through another program, the uh, assembler that translates to machine language, or you can have machine language for a certain processor. Or it can be another high-level language, for example C. Uh, the first C++ compiler compiled to C, so you didn't need to... It was easier to write something that translates to C than to tra that translates to, to uh, run, uh, executable machine language. But this is not all the output. What have I forgotten? What more outputs do you get from the compiler? Error. Exactly. Error messages. Which is a very important part. I mean, if you had to program with a system that doesn't tell you any error messages, that would be really difficult. Uh, plus, sometimes you get warnings, things that are not errors uh, preventing the program to compile, but probably something strange you're doing and the compiler warns you about it. Especially in a language like C and C++ that allows you to do almost anything you want. If you have a program like This. this is not an error. This will automatically convert 3.14 to 3 and then put it in the uh, variable x if you're using C. If it's Java, you get an error message. But this will, from a good C compiler or a helpful C compiler, give you a warning. Usually you can turn on and turn off warnings. And Say again? W error. Oh, that's another. That, then you translate all warnings to, to errors instead. Uh, my recommendation is turn on as many warnings as you can. Uh, warnings, if you using the compiler GCC, which we will do in the course. Uh, all warnings, except it's not really all warnings, so you need extra warnings. 
Yeah, and then, then you can add some more, you can uh, be pedantic. Then it follows the standard, the C standard pedantically. And of course, W error that translates or changes every warning to an error. So you can't compile and run your program if it has any warnings. Yeah, one interesting point here is that we have learned, or through the years, uh, we have learned how to split the compiler into ports and which techniques to use. They say here that the first ever compiler, a Fortran compiler from back in the 1950s, it took uh, 18 staff years. I don't know if there were 18 people working for one year or one person working for 18 years, uh, <clears throat> but some combination there. Uh, it took 18 years to develop. And now we can do a similar compiler as a student project in a few months. So we have learned how to, which techniques we should use when building compilers. Uh, if we look at translation now, how do we translate our program? Uh, let's compare this to natural language, normal human languages like Swedish and English. If we have um, some English text here. Now you can do it with style. And then you want to translate this to Swedish. Now in Swedish is nu. You, do, can, well, <coughs> can can be a verb that says you are able to do something, or it can be a can, in Swedish burk. So let's choose one of them, burk, do, Well, do, do, re, mi, fa, so, la. It's a tone, which is called do in Swedish. It, I, that's information technology. Yeah, <clears throat> as you can see, if I do the translation, the translation like this, it gets completely wrong. Nu, du, burk, do it. Uh, this doesn't work. So what you need to do instead is to translate this into some internal format some sort of understanding of what this actually means. And then you translate that understanding to, to uh, in this case, Swedish. Nu kan du göra det med stil. And so on. And the same thing with computer languages. You read the input and analyze the input an analysis phase, and then we can call it synthesis, where you create something from that understanding. So it's a two-step process. And we will see later that the analysis phase and the synthesis phase are uh, split into several if you do a, a finer um, partition here, you get more phases. Okay. And here, the trees I was talking about earlier, that's uh, much of the representation here, representation of the understanding internally in the compiler, will be using trees of various kinds. Okay. Compiler and their context, the uh, environment that 
a compiler exists in. We have a number of program here, programs here, and let me start by drawing a um, computer here, or at least the screen and uh, the keyboard. <coughs> you uh, use an editor. This is a program to create a source file, uh, the source code. In some language. And if you're using an integrated development environment such as Visual Studio, uh, <coughs> then you won't actually run a separate program that's an editor. But in this environment, there is an editor. May run as a separate program, but may not also, might not. Uh, here <coughs> comes the compiler. That translates not directly into a complete executable program, but into what we call a link module or object module. Uh, let me write it up here. So if you had a uh, file uh, called foo.c, then you will get, depending on the operating system, you might get foo.o if it's uh, Unix, or foo, I believe, .ob if it's uh, Windows. It is executable code. It's just that it's not a complete program. It's just this part here that is created into, uh, translated into executable code. Uh, for it to become a complete program, you need a linker. And what does the linker do? Well, it takes your uh, <coughs> small part of a program uh, together with others. Um, if you have a somewhat large program, it will not be just one file. It will be a number of different modules that you create. So you might have fun or two and so on, uh, plus <coughs> various libraries. For example, print here. Somewhere there is code written that performs this print. If you're using C and remember printf, you have all these format specifiers percent f, percent s, and so on, uh, that need to be handled. So the printf function is a fairly large function, which Bill Gates or someone wrote for us, so it will be in a library somewhere. And then you have what we can call the runtime system. Parts of it is built-in libraries, such as for uh, printf. Uh, but also if you have startup code that is needed for the program. All this is built into a complete program by the linker. Executable program uh, might be called foo or foo.exe depending on uh, operating system. So when is the linker doing its work? Well, that depends. You have uh, what is called static and dynamic linking. With static linking, you build your program in advance, and then you can distribute your program. Uh, it is stored a complete executable program uh, on your disk 
Uh, and then when you start the program, it reads the entire program from disk and runs it. But with dynamic linking, you don't actually perform the linking phase until just when you start the program. So with dynamic linking, all of the programs on the same system, on the same computer, can share the same libraries and the same runtime system. You just link, that, link them together with the, each program as it starts. And the words, the terms static and dynamic, what do they mean? Well, in uh, everyday language, static means it doesn't move, and dynamic means it moves and maybe with great speed. Uh, <clears throat> in a compiler context, static means at compile time, while dynamic means at uh, run time, when the program is executed. So you can have, for example, static checking of a program. Then you look at the source code and runtime checking. Then you see if any errors occur when the program is run. Okay? What about the interpreter then? Well, here you have the interpreter. Which, like the compiler, reads the source code. It might perform the same analysis of the source code that the compiler does. Uh, it may build some sort of internal format, but the important part is that the interpreter actually performs the actions, it prints high. So is the Java compiler a compiler or is it an interpreter? Depends on how you see it. If you see it as a system with uh, the compile part and the Java virtual machine, then you could call it an interpreter, but typically you run the compiler first and then you distribute the intermediate format and then you run it. So the Java compiler is probably a compiler and not an interpreter. Uh, I should also say that there are really not any compiled and interpreted languages. You typically say that okay C is a compiled language because you compile it uh, while Python is a uh, interpreted language because you have a Python interpreter that you run, you, and you feed your source code to the interpreter. But there is nothing that stops you from writing a C interpreter or a Python compiler. There exists Python compiler, compilers. So uh, it's not really the languages that are interpreted and uh, compiled, even though the typical execution of some languages is of a certain type. So, you almost always compile C code, you almost always interpret Python code. Okay? Let's now get into this part and see that it actually consists of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven phases. Faser in Swedish. Uh, <clears throat> where the source code is sent to the first phase, then that phase uh, translates that source code into another format, which is then fed to the next phase, and so on, until in the final phase you get the executable code. So let's look at the, these seven phases of the compiler. Let's start with the input to uh, the program. You have source code and 
let's say you have a, one um, line in a program. And this is text. If I split it, so we see that it's a sequence of characters. Line feeder at the end. This is sent to the lexical analyzer. Which is not a program in itself, but a part of the compiler. Uh, also called a scanner. And what does the scanner do? It <coughs> scans uh, the source code and sees that, okay, the smallest meaningful part, this is an identifier. Then you have some blank space, which we don't care about. So the next meaningful thing is this assignment operator. You have another identifier. You have more blank space, ignore that. You have this plus operator. You have another identifier. You have this um, multiplication and then you have this floating point number 6.0. And you have a semicolon which can uh, be meaningful which is meaningful in many languages. And then you have uh, the line feed, which in some languages uh, has a meaning, but in uh, most normal languages like C and uh, Java and so on, it's just uh, white space. It's ignored. Not in Python though, because in Python the, uh, <coughs> the lines have meaning. So what do we get here? Well, we get a sequence of, not characters, but of tokens. Because this, these uh, me smallest meaningful elements of the input are called tokens. Which, if you look it up in a uh, lexicon, means uh, um, something meaningful that you can give. Spårvagnspolett in Swedish is called token. Uh, if you get a, well, I don't know the English word for Spårvagnspolett, token. Um, you get a small coin-like object that you can uh, uh, give to someone and it gives you a free ride on the streetcar. So, a token And typically, we don't care about exactly what the identifier is. I just say that this is identifier number, let's say 17. So it's easier to work inside the program and talk about identifier number 17 instead of uh, a specific string. At least you don't need to compare strings later when you uh, see if it's the same identifier. You just see, is it the same number? Uh, you have this one. You have another ID, let's say number three. You have a plus sign. You have uh, yet another identifier, 62 maybe. You have the, oh, and so on. A floating point constant. So, so. so here is a sequence of tokens. So in the rest of the program, we don't care about any white space, how many spaces you had in uh, 
in your source code. And we don't care what the identifiers actually were. Until you need to print error messages, then you need to say there's something wrong with identifier post, not with identifier 17. Now we take the sequence of tokens and send it to the syntactical or syntax analyzer. What this does, it compares your uh, uh, program, or rather the sequence of tokens, to the grammar of the language. Grammatik in Swedish. And this is called a parser. So you sort of get, depending on the grammar of the language, you build a syntax analyzer for that particular grammar. For example, you can have a grammar that says that you can um, you're allowed to have an identifier, an equal sign, and then an expression of any type. Or, and then you need more rules to say exactly what an expression is. Uh, so this will work, but if you try to say something like 7 equals uh, i plus r times 6.0, then you will get a syntax error because you're not allowed to start your assignment with a number. It must be an identifier. Here we build a tree. If we go back to our original code here, we had if we <coughs> look at how this is calculated, you know that uh, multiplication has higher precedence than addition. So we will start with this part and then we will create a complete expression like that. And then we have the complete assignment that looks like this, that may or may not include the semicolon depending on the language. And you know that if you have something that consists of parts inside parts, you can write that as a tree. So you can say that you have an assignment <coughs> which consists of the identifier pools, and then you have, since uh, the next level here is plus, you have i plus the multiplication here, or times 6.0. So you get a tree looking something like that. Let's um, draw the same tree here. But I use these uh, numbers instead. Let's for a moment leave the computer language we're working with here and go back to human languages like uh, uh, Swedish and English. Uh, we have the same structure there. Uh, we have individual words which uh, <coughs> correspond to tokens. And we have a grammar, just like we have for, for computer languages. 
So if I have um, I eat cannibals. You have individual words that are tokens. And you know that a book that contains all the words is called the lexicon. So lexicon and lexical, that's the same word. It means working with individual words. And then you have the grammar that, for example, uh, <coughs> says that this is a sentence, this is a... I'm not sure what it's in uh, English, it's subject in Swedish. Noun phrase, maybe? Uh, and then you have a... I think it may be called a verb phrase. I'm not sure about that either. You have a verb and you have, uh, in this case, I think it's called an object, the thing you eat. So that's the grammar. Then you have another level that you need to look at your sentence. Here it's fairly obvious what it means. I eat cannibals. Okay, I capture some cannibals and I eat them. Uh, I see the man with the telescope. I see the man with the telescope. Well, the individual words are okay. Uh, the uh, syntax also okay. It follows grammar for English. But the thing is, what does it mean? Does it mean that I am standing here and I look at the man over here, and he is carrying a telescope, and I see him. Or does it mean that it's I who has the telescope, and I look through the telescope and see the man over there? So which meaning is the right one? Well, we don't know. And this is a semantic level. You have lexical level, syntactical level, and then you have a semantic level. And semantic is about, semantics is about meaning. So when uh, <clears throat> American politicians don't want to answer questions, they say, let's not argue semantics. What they mean is, let's not argue what, what I say actually means. I don't think that's what they hope that we interpret it as, but that's what it means. So semantics is about meaning, and we will look at the next phase here, the meaning of our program. Okay, let's take 15 minutes break. Let's continue. <clears throat> we had uh, the lexical phase, the lexical analyzer, that uh, splits the characters in the input into tokens, so you get a sequence of tokens. And then you have the syntax analyzer, the second phase, or parser, which usually builds a tree. It doesn't have to, but it compares the input, the sequence of tokens, to the grammar of the language. For example, that you can have one expression plus another expression. But then comes the semantic phase. So the meaning of this, what does plus mean? What does plus mean? Add x and y. Say? Add x and y. And x. Well, it depends. I mean, <clears throat> if, let's see, let's say it's uh, Java int x equals 2, int y equals 3. If this is part of your program, well, then it's addition, normal integer addition. If you have, uh, let's say, float, uh, 
and then you do x plus y, then mathematically it's the same thing, but internally in the computer, the operations done and the bits, uh, what happens to the bits in memory, uh, can be completely different depending on if it's integer, an integer operation or a floating point operation. And if we have a language such as Java or C Sharp, that lets you have a string variables. Well, if I do x plus y now, then it's no longer normal numerical addition. Then it's string concatenation. So what you get out of this is hi-ho. So, for example, if you have uh, uh, 2 plus 3 plus 4, well, what do you get out of this one in most normal languages? 2 plus 3, 5, plus 4, 9. But if we work with strings, well, what happens here, it depends on the language, but quite often what you get is, oh, it's a number, but I add it to a string, so let's convert this to a number and convert this to a number, so you get a string that says 2, 3, 4. So this is about semantics. What does the things are written in my program According to the lexical rules and the, uh, the grammar, <coughs> what do they mean? This plus sign, what does it mean? Well, it can mean completely different things depending on uh, the context. So you need to work with semantics. And in this case, uh, <coughs> is this uh, integer operations or floating point operations? Well, you need to check what kind of uh, data types does these ident these variables pos and i and r? Well, you need to look up, look that up, and then depending on the rules of the language, in some languages they must all be floating point, otherwise you get an error, and in some other languages you convert convert things so you get um, something that can be calculated. So if we look again at <coughs> uh, our tree that I had here before, There is something called the symbol table, where when you declare a variable, or the first time you see an identifier, you put it in the symbol table. So if our program said, let's say, int pos at the start, and maybe int r, maybe float i, then in your symbol table, which I will write or draw here, not because it's a face, but because it's an important part of the compiler. Here you have the symbol table, which says that, oh, <coughs> identifier number seven, uh, 17, I mean, identifier number 17 is called pos, and it's an integer variable. Identifier number three, is a i, which is a floating point variable, according to my declarations over there, and identifier number 62, r, is also an integer variable. So in the symbol table, where the scanner puts things and finds things, uh, there you have data types. So you know now that, okay, identifier number 17, that is an integer, uh, number three is a float, 
Number 62 is an int. And now you can look at the operations. Here you have an integer multiplied with a floating point number. And it depends on the language, as I said, what happens. If it's C, then you convert this one into a floating point number two. So you can get floating point multiplication. Because typically, on the hardware level in the processor, when you actually perform the multiplication, it needs to be the same data types. So you need to convert. So you here insert a conversion. Convert to float. Here you have float plus, well, it will be another float here. So you don't need to do any conversion. But here, when you put it in uh, the variable pos, then it's an integer. So you need to convert it to an integer. So you have another conversion here. So what you do is you decorate the parse tree, the syntax tree, I mean, uh, with data types and with operations. So if I draw the same tree here, and let me also draw phase three here, the semantic analyzer. You get this input. Is three. Uh, as I said, it analyzes the the um, uh, so the pro source program with respect to data types. So, <clears throat> more concretely, what it does it it takes this syntax tree and decorates it with data types. So you will get a result that says something like this: ID seventeen is an int. Here you have a conversion from float to int. Here you have uh, identifier 3, which was i, which is a float. Uh, you have multiplication. And what kind of addition? Well, it's float, but the multiplication is uh, also float, and you have uh, or so you have int to float conversion of the value you get from ID number uh, sixty two, which was an int. And here you get 6.0, which is a float. So depending on the data types, as we saw, the things that actually happens in the program can, can be completely different depending on data types. So I have decorated, in Swedish, klättträdet, decorated the tree with uh, type information, what is ints, what is floats, and some additional operations to convert uh, data types to other data types. Because later when we generate actual machine code, actually executable code, then we need to have the correct type of multiplication. We might have completely different machine instructions for uh, integer addition, uh, intermultiplication and floating point multiplication. Okay? So if the output from the parser is a syntax tree, the output from the semantic analyzer is a decorated syntax tree. Now, we can work with this tree, but uh, 
it may be easier if we first convert it to something that is more similar to the actual instructions that we'll generate later. So we have an intermediate code generator. that translates this to some sort of uh, code that's easy to use for, for the rest of the phases in the compiler. Uh, for example, <coughs> you might do something like this, that you start by converting this uh, identifier number 62 and put it in a variable called temporary variable 1. No, correction. Um. So then I calculate another temporary variable uh, by multiplying temp1 and 6.0 and put it in temp2. And here I need to add and put in temp3 uh, first id3, id3 plus temp2. Right? Temp4 equals float to int temp3 and then finally id17 equals temp4. Uh, this is just one possible way of uh, having intermediate code. And as you can see I don't have, I don't have a tree anymore. Uh, I don't have any complex expressions with both plus and times. Instead I have a single operation in each uh, instruction here, in this intermediate code. So this will be more similar to what we can do later on the processor uh, machine language level. And this is, of course, intermediate code. Generated by the intermediate code generator. And the next step is optimization, code optimizer. I'm not sure if there's anything that can be optimized. Well, one thing could be optimized. Instead of storing the uh, float to int value in a temporary variable, you could replace these two with just id17 equals float to int temp3. So I, I save, I can optimize away uh, the variable temp4 and the extra step of putting the result in temp4 and then copying it to id17. But the code optimizer, it optimizes the code, it removes unnecessary steps. It can do much more advanced things than that also, but let's for the moment just say it removes unnecessary steps. Next step. Yeah. Say again. Here. Uh, this is this step here, because after the addition here, after the plus, I get a floating point number, because I uh, add together this floating point number with the floating point result of the multiplication. 
so we have a floating point number. But we said before that ID17 pools is an integer variable. So I can't store the floating point number in the integer variable. I need to first convert it to, a, uh, to an integer. So here I have float to int. I need to do this conversion here, which I wrote as float to int here. Okay. So here we have also the same intermediate code, but smaller and or faster. And then the reason I say and or faster is that uh, it sometimes is possible to create more executable code that will run faster or less, uh, a smaller executable code that will run slower. Um, for example, there is something called loop unrolling. If you, in your program, has a loop for i equals zero to, you do something ten times, uh, x equals If you do this, <coughs> you can unroll this loop. So instead of a loop, you have x plus equals, oh, let's say four here, so I don't have to write so much. Uh, x equals plus one x plus two x plus this is the same will do exactly the same thing but we no longer have a loop this will run faster because we don't need to jump back to the start we don't need to check the variable i uh, and update it uh, so and then this can of course be optimized to something along the line of um, just add six so this part is called loop unrolling, but this can be more code. It will run faster, but there will be more code. Even though typically optimizations is of the type where you just remove something unnecessary, then it will be both smaller and faster. Okay, uh, this code optimizer is called the machine independent code optimizer. Because, for example, removing this extra step will be faster on any CPU. There are also optimizations that are dependent on the particular type of uh, CPU you're running it on. But that will be another optimization phase later. Let's uh, say that this is phase four. This is phase five. And now we are going to continue to phase number six. I will remove the first ones here. Uh, from over here, the optimized intermediate code goes here to code generator that actually generates the uh, target code, phase number six. And as we said, it creates the target code, uh, target program in the target language. So it may be machine code, it may be assembler, or it can be C or something else. But assuming it's, um, 
assembler language. Um, something along the side. A machine instruction that converts. Hmm. Load into register one. Um, ID 62. So from the memory position called ID 62, we load into register one. Uh, then we might have machine instruction to convert from uh, uh, integer to float. Or at into R2 and so on. Now we're almost finished. Uh, the code generator. Uh, chooses uh, machine instructions and puts things in registers. And that's one very important part of the code generator's work to decide in which machine registers to put each thing. Maybe I should add some more instructions here. Uh, I will move from uh, into temp two from R two, and then in the next step, I will multiply. Temp two or no correction move temp one. I mean the result of this conversion is put in temp one, and then if we look at each such uh, intermediate code uh, instruction uh, and just translate it to uh, machine language, then I will do something like move from. Uh, Temp one, two, or two. Uh, <coughs> multiply or two with number six point zero and put the result in temp two. Now, um, this was the naive and, and straightforward way of translating instructions. Uh, <coughs> if I look at this one, well, take the contents of ID62, put it in register, uh, execute the instruction that converts that to a floating point number, and then put it back in temp1. And then we look at the next one, well, get the contents of temp1 from a, uh, into a register, multiply with 6, and put in temp2 somewhere in the memory. But if we look at the resulting code here, we can see that is this instruction really necessary? Do I need to fetch temp1 from memory, uh, from the place in memory that's called temp1 and put in R2? Well, not really, because I just had it in R2 and copied it to temp2. There's no reason to, uh, to temp1 and then copy, there's no reason to then copy it from temp1 again back to R2. So we can remove this instruction. And that is the job of the, the uh, uh, machine dependent code optimizer. It performs this. So here we have machine Uh, 
the final phase, phase number seven. It performs this operation. And finally we get uh, our end result. The target program in uh, target language, which in this case was, uh, was assembler for some CPU I just invented. So now we have seen the uh, seven different phases in the compiler. And if we look at, or if we remember the ones I erased here, we had first lexical analysis, we had then uh, uh, syntax analysis, and then semantic analysis. Although those work with the source code. So that is the analysis phase, or the analysis part of the compiler, let's not call it a phase, uh, the first three phases. Then we have the code generator, the intermediate code generator, the code optimizer, the uh, real code generator, and the machine dependent code optimizer. Those work with the target code, the target program. So there we have the the uh, synthesis phase. Synthes synthesize something means create something. Uh, so we have the analysis part and the uh, synthesis part of the compiler. Okay? And the intermediate code here sort of connects them together. Comments so far. The most part of this course will uh, spend in the phase I erased here, the uh, syntax analysis phase. We will look at grammars on how to write parsers, how to create parsers. Even though we will look at a bit at the other phases too, yeah, especially lexical analysis. If we go back for a moment to the lexical analyzer, and I'm going to erase these things. You remember this input pools equals e plus you have uh, tokens which are the actual things you find in your source program you have tokens token types and this is the token type identifier, this is the token type uh, assignment operator, and so on. Uh, there's also the term lexeme, in Swedish lexeme. That is just the actual characters that represent that token. So in the case of the, uh, the identifier pos, it is this string, P-O-S. Uh, it could be just this equal sign, or if you have, let's say, the increment operator in C++, then you have an operator that consists of uh, two characters, plus plus. So each of these are one token, and the lexeme is um, uh, 
the actual characters. Then it's translated to something like ID 17. And this we call the lexical value. Lexikonisk värde in Swedish. It is an identifier, but which identifier? Also, when you find a floating point number such as uh, 6.0, then you have uh, the three characters 6 point and 0 as the lexeme. Uh, the type is a floating point value. And the, le the lexical value, well, which floating point value? 6.0. Token, token type, lexeme and lexical value. Important terms to remember. Uh, if we uh, leave the scanner and look at the parser, that is the syntax analysis part, Grammars are important in Swedish grammatik. And we will look at a grammar or grammars uh, as a set of rules that specify which expressions are allowed, which uh, combinations of tokens are allowed. So for example, you can say that an expression might be a uh, floating point number. It might be an identifier. So if you write 6.0, it's an expression. If you write x, it's an expression. And then you may be able to uh, add two expressions together. So if I have the input that says x plus 6.0, well, this is an identifier, this is a plus operator, and this is the floating point uh, number. Then this is an expression. And you can multiply two expressions. For example, x times 6.0. And just as we said about this will yield an expression. Now, this grammar has a problem. If I write x plus y times z. Well, translated to a sequence of tokens, this is an identifier plus another identifier times a third identifier. And if I apply these three rules up here, okay, uh, the, the three identifiers, they are expressions. So I have an expression here, I have an expression here, and I have an expression here. Now I can start by adding together the first two identifiers, calling this 
an expression. And then multiply that expression with this expression. Or I can start using this rule and say that this identifier multiplied with that identifier is an expression. And then the final big expression is this identifier, this expression, plus the result of this expression. So I can group this together in two different ways. Which means that this is an ambiguous grammar. In Swedish, tvetydig. And this is a problem because if I <clears throat> if I can both calculate this as 5 times 4 equals 20 or as 2 plus 12 equals 14, well, which one is right? If both are right, then I don't really know what I'm doing because which one happens to be right this time. So I want to avoid ambiguous grammars. And we will look later at how we can do that uh, by uh, specifying, well, in reality, uh, if it's normal math rules, which one is correct? 14, 14 yes, because multiplication has higher precedence. You start by multiplication, three times four, is 12 plus, uh, 2 plus 12 equals 14. And we can do that in the grammar too. But as it, says now, as it stands now, is this is an ambiguous grammar and you don't want that. Good. Uh, we will look much more at grammars and these rules that uh, describe the, the grammar. I should also mention that in the course we will work with scanners and parsers, both hand-coded in C. You write a C program or C++ or some other language uh, which performs these uh, tasks that the scanner and parser performs. And we will also use tools that help you to create a scanner and a parser. And among the tools, uh, there is one called YAC or in a newer version, Bison, which lets you basically input these rules and then it creates a parser for you. And there's another one called, another tool called Lex, or in a newer version, Flex, uh, which is also the name of some replacement for flash animations. But this is a program that lets you input some rules, how your tokens look, and then it creates a scanner for you. We will both work with hand-coded parsers and scanners and uh, these tools to create them. Okay. And all the instructions for the labs and for, uh, for um, what I'll do on the lectures here uh, are already on the web. Uh, not all of them are entirely translated to English yet. Uh, they will soon be, at least I hope they will soon be. Okay, any comments or questions before we say goodbye for today? Say again? The point of, uh, well, you, you describe the language. If you have a programming language, you need to describe exactly what is allowed to write in that programming language and how things will be grouped together. And you use the grammar for that. Okay, I don't think we have anything else until next Monday, so we'll meet again then. Okay, thank you.